This is the ultimate guide to bulking on keto. That means building muscle while you're doing a ketogenic diet is entirely possible, but this isn't just going to be a justification video. This isn't just going to be research. I'm gonna give you exactly what you need to do. I'm gonna give you the formula that I've used with clients in terms of helping them build muscle while they're on keto. I'm gonna give you macronutrient breakdown. I'm gonna give you net calorie surplus, things like that. But in order for all of that to make sense, I need to have a preamble, but it needs to be loaded up with some science and some research that brought me to the ultimate conclusion that I came to that can help you, okay? So make sure you watch this entire video and it'll all make sense. And honestly, it's an unbiased approach. I'm gonna have studies from each side. I have some studies that don't always favor keto. So let's take a look at all of it. Hey, you are tuned into the internet's leading performance and nutrition channel, keto, fasting, and everything in between with new videos coming out every single Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Also, make sure you head on over to highleat.com so you can check out the apparel that I'm always wearing in my videos. All right, so I will get to the breakdown of this, but let me go ahead and start with a study that's pretty interesting. It was published in the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Okay, this study took a look at 26 resistance-trained males, okay, so people that were experienced with working out already. And for 11 weeks, they divided these people into either a ketogenic diet group or a traditional Western diet group. Now, all in all, at the end of the 11-week study, the ketogenic diet group had a 2.1 kilogram increase in lean body mass, more so than the Western diet. Okay, so we found that the keto diet ultimately built more muscle. Okay, we also found that the keto diet lost 2.2 pounds of fat mass, more so than the Western diet. Okay, so yeah, we know at the end of the study, at the end of 11 weeks, the keto diet actually built more muscle and lost more fat. But it gets a little bit more interesting. You see, when you look deep into the study, you actually find that weeks one through 10, the diets didn't change. It was keto diet versus Western diet. And the results at the end of 10 weeks were actually about the same. The keto diet had about the same amount of muscle gained as the Western diet, okay? So we know that for muscle building, weeks one through 10, keto diet versus Western diet ended up about the same. But weeks 10 and 11, what they had them do between that time was carb up on the keto group. Now, they had the keto diet add carbs into the equation. And then they ended up having a massive increase. Then they took the lead in terms of muscle building. So what that tells us is that they probably had a big influx of glycogen, carbohydrates that went into the muscles and swelled them up. So what's interesting here is that by and large, if you compare the keto diet and the Western diet according to this study, you're gonna have about the same amount of muscle building, plain and simple. So that's kind of cool right then and there. But once carbs are added back into the mix, you take the lead. You're sort of like a loaded gun. It's like once carbs are back in the equation, boom, then you just speed ahead. It's pretty cool. It's kind of like drafting. It's like you stay behind the leader and then all of a sudden you slingshot and go ahead of them, kind of like Talladega Knights. All right, so now let's take a look at study two. And this is a really similar study. Okay, see this took a look at two groups, an isocaloric and an isonitrogenous, meaning that both groups have the same amount of calories and the same amount of protein, keto diet versus Western diet. This study took a look at body composition and performance. So what they did is for 11 weeks, they took 25 participants and divided them again into two groups, keto diet group, and Western diet group. Same kind of structure as this first study. Weeks one through 10, keto diet versus Western diet. Week 10, they had the keto diet carb up again. Okay, so here's what was interesting in this one. In this study, weeks one through 10, the lean body mass of the keto diet group was 2.2 kilogram increase, and the lean body mass increase in the Western diet group was 4.4. Okay, well that's kind of weird. So again, what they found in this case was that the keto diet group didn't build as much muscle as the Western diet group. Okay, well that's kind of scary. But then when you take a look again at week 11 or week 10 before 11, when the carbs are added into the equation for the keto group, they had an increase of 4.8% in their lean body mass, therefore surpassing them. So they found again that once carbs are added back into the equation, that the lean body mass increased on the keto group. So again, you're like a loaded gun. So if you were to take both groups that have the same amount of carbs in their system at the beginning, and then they go through the process, well, the keto group is going to lose muscle glycogen. So of course their lean body mass is going to appear less in this particular case. Why it didn't in the other study, I honestly don't know. But then when carbs are added back into the equation, boom, slingshot again. So it's like they just lost the muscle glycogen, but when glycogen was actually restored back to equal amounts between the two groups, the keto group actually took the lead. So pretty interesting. Now the other thing they found is that strength and performance didn't differ between the two groups. They both had the same strength and performance, but the other thing that was really cool is that the keto diet group actually had a bigger increase in testosterone by quite a bit than the Western diet group. Testosterone ultimately anabolic, going to lead to more muscle growth. 
Okay, I still have a little bit more justification and a little bit more things to make sense here before I give you the breakdown, so I hope you're still sticking with me. This next study was published in the Journal of Physiology, and this study is important for the reason that I want to show you that protein won't kick you out of keto if you have enough fats in the mix, okay? So what this study did is it took a look at three groups. It took a very high carb group, and then it took another carb group that had about the same amount of carbs, but spaced them out throughout the day. So it's called a periodized carb group. So roughly the same amount of carbs, just split out differently throughout the day. And then they compared that to a low carb, high fat keto group. Okay, here's what was really interesting, and here's what I'm ultimately trying to draw from this study. The keto group was on this specific kind of macro breakdown. They consumed less than 50 grams of carbs per day. Then they consumed 78% of their energy from fat. And then they consumed roughly one gram per pound of body weight of protein. Now that's more protein than I would normally even recommend. So they had a high amount of protein, but they also had a tremendous amount of fat. Well, guess what? They found that their ketone levels were always between 0.8 millimoles and two millimoles, meaning they were definitely in a state of ketosis even with that much protein so long as their fats were that high. Now, normally people would say, well, that would cause me to have a ton of calories, and I'll explain that later because there is a way around it. But the long and the short is you can have a lot of protein as long as the fats are high enough to continue to create ketones. The other thing we have to remember is that the ketogenic diet by itself creates ketones, and ketones are muscle sparing. Beta-hydroxybutyrate stops or slows down the breakdown of leucine, leucine oxidation, therefore meaning you don't have the muscle breakdown that's naturally occurring if you're not on a keto diet, or not as much at least. So that's powerful in and of itself. And then one last study that I have to reference so that everything makes sense, there's a study that was published in the American Journal of Physiology, Endocrinology, and Metabolism. Okay, this study actually found that protein synthesis is not heightened with the co-ingestion of carbohydrates. What that means is you do not need to be consuming protein with carbs to increase protein synthesis. Protein synthesis is there on its own. It doesn't need carbs to help it. The old theory used to be if you ingest carbs, you're going to spike your insulin, the protein's going to increase or uptake more. That may kind of be the case, but the overall ruling is that protein synthesis still stays elevated. You're still going to create new muscle from the protein that you consume, even in the absence of carbohydrates. So now we have to take a look at another piece of this. I've explained everything with keto. Now you may or may not be someone that implements intermittent fasting from time to time, but it's going to be a part of what I tell you to do if you're trying to bulk on keto. So pay attention to this really quick. So it has been found that when you're training in a fasted state or when you're fasting in general and you're just working out, that you're going to have an increase in what is called P70S6 kinase or P70S6K. You see, elevated levels of P70S6K indicate that we're shuttling amino acids into the muscle to actually rebuild it. So it's been shown that when you're fasting, you have significantly elevated levels of this P70S6 kinase. That literally means that your protein synthesis and the amino acids in your body are more likely to go into the muscle and actually build muscle after a fasted period than not. Okay, so believe me, this is all gonna make sense. Now, the how-to section. All right, how do you actually put this all together now that we've seen all the science knowing that it can be done? All right, here it is. When you go on a keto bulk, you are going to be in a tremendous calorie surplus day over day, a lot. Okay, but it will make sense. So what I suggest you do is go with the macronutrient ratio that was broken down in that one study. Go with 0.8 to 1 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Okay? That's probably going to be overkill, but in this case, it's going to be perfect. Okay? You're going to have definitely enough protein. But I want to make sure, make sure, make sure that you get at least 75% of your calories from fat. Okay? So you might be doing the math in your head right now. A 200-pound person, that means that you're going to have to have 200 grams of protein, but you still need to make sure that that only amounts for like 20% of your calories. So that means that the rest needs to come from fat and a little teeny bit from carbs. You're probably thinking, well, that puts me at a huge calorie surplus because it's so much fat. That's unreasonable. You're right. It is. That's a lot of calories. You would definitely gain fat doing that, but you're going to put yourself in a very good state where you know you're going to have ketones. You know you're going to have protein. You'll be able to build muscle faster than the other people. So let's address the part about you getting fat to make sure that doesn't happen, okay? No one wants to gain a bunch of fat on a bulk, okay, period. You're going to gain a little bit of fat, but no one wants to gain a ton. So this is where intermittent fasting, just two days per week, or even three, really comes in handy. 
I want you to not look at your calories in and calories out on a daily basis anymore. You need to back up and look at them over the course of a week. Okay? So what that means is that two days a week, you're going to fast. Okay? You're going to train in the morning if you can, and you're going to fast. What this is going to do is it's going to bring your net calories down for the week. Okay? When you break your fast, you're only going to have protein and maybe a small amount of fat. This is your fat loss day, for lack of a better way of saying it. You have five hardcore building days and two aggressive fat loss days. So net net, you're going to be in more of a bulk than you are a cut. So what's going to end up happening is at the end of the week, I want you to end up being at a 5% net positive calorie surplus. Okay, so if you're 20% day over day, I want the fasting days to bring it down aggressively enough so that by the time you measure on a seven day rotation, you're only in a 5% surplus. You're only consuming 5% more calories than you're burning. That's just enough to put you in that state where you can gain weight, but not go overboard and gain a bunch of fat. You see, the interesting thing is, is like I mentioned with that fasting study, is fasting increases protein synthesis and it allows those amino acids to get shuttled in through the activation of that enzyme, okay, of that P70S6K. So training in the morning, then wait until the end of the day and consume your protein because guess what? Protein synthesis stays elevated for 24 hours. You don't have to eat within that anabolic window. That's total nonsense. Protein synthesis stays elevated for 24 hours. So therefore, you actually eat your protein at the end of the day and your protein synthesis is still elevated, but you're in a calorie deficit for that day, but not for that week. But you're in a deficit, but your protein is going to get taken up, and you're going to build muscle that day, even though you're in a deficit. So newsflash, you cannot build muscle if you're overall in a deficit long term. But what determines if you're in a deficit over the course of a day versus over the course of a week? We need to be in a surplus over the course of a week. Now, one more thing. Some people cannot work out in the morning. If you work out in the evening, that's fine too. And when you break your fast, you're going to do so right after your workout. You're going to be extra insulin sensitive. You're going to be insulin sensitive because of the fast and because of your workout. So that might be one of the only times that I would say consuming some whey protein would actually be applicable. I'm not the biggest fan of whey, but in that particular instance, it truly has a practical application. Okay, so 5% net calorie increase, 75 to 80% of your calories coming from fat, okay? 18 to 20-ish coming from protein and the rest coming from the trace carbs. That's the breakdown that I put many of my clients on that are trying to build muscle and end up succeeding. So I hope this breaks it down. If you need further elaboration, just let me know and I'll do a part two in this video. Also, post your comments and your questions down below and I will try to answer as many as I can in next week's comment answer Q&A. I'll see you soon.